We're talking Zootopia with the head of Harvard's Museum of Zoology. Next on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Faith Saley. Today we're going to talk about the Disney flick Zootopia. Joining us is James Hankin, the Alexander Agassi Professor of Zoology at Harvard University, as well as the Director of Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Welcome, James. Hello. Glad to be here. Zootopia is the 2016 Walt Disney Studio animated film centering on the blossoming friendship between country bunny Judy Hopps and wily city fox Nick Wilde. As the first rabbit to join the police force of the city of Zootopia, Judy jumps right into a mysterious case of animals gone primal. Probably best if you don't have a predator as a partner. In the real zoological world, do animals overcome their predator-prey instincts? Yes and no. The um, you know animal behavior is much more complicated than people tend to think of it. So we think of a predator, and you think something that's always out to eat something, and it's just it's just it's growling and it's looking to tear something up. And prey are these meek little things that just kind of can't do any are helpless. It's not that's not the real world. In the real world, predators, yes, they will consume other things on certain circumstances, but predators can often show very caring, you know, behaviors, uh, very sensitive sides, if you will. Uh, best example would be a lot of the maternal behavior shown by female predators towards their uh, f uh, family groups, and especially their offspring. And prey at the same time can be pretty nasty and pretty violent uh, if they want to, or when the circumstances dictate. So it's, it's, the predator prey, there, there is truth to predator and prey, of course, but it's a much more complex situation, much more subtle differences. And also, we're predators, and we're not always out on the hunt. Correct. We're, we're an un unusual one because in what we eat, we're, we're tech, we'd be classified by zoologists as omnivores. We eat both animal, we're, we're evolved to eat both animal and plant foods. So yes, we're part predators, but we also graze or eat, eat plant matter. And at any given moment, some, you know, one animal's prey is the predator of another animal, right? Exactly. And, uh, well, except in, in, you could say, well, there are certain prey that are herbivores, meaning they themselves eat plant matter. They don't typically consume it, so they wouldn't be regarded as, as predators. But, yes, there's some predators that are in turn eaten by, they're the prey of larger predators and so forth. So, again, it's a much more complex situation. Depends a lot on context. Do some animal species get along better with other species? Absolutely. Some, um, I mean, the get, getting along can reach really extreme proportions. There are, there are many examples of so-called mutualisms where different animals benefit by, in, of different species benefit by interacting with one another. Um, What's an example of that? An example of a mutualism would be one of my favorites are the so cleaner wrasses or cleaner fishes, which are fishes that are found in many different coral reefs around the world. They're pretty small. They take up residence in a particular part of the reef. And much larger fishes, including sharks and other predators, which under other circumstances might eat this thing, this little cleaner wrasse, in effect almost form a little line or a queue and, and they move up successively, and the cleaner rats will then go about picking off parasitic invertebrates off their skin, off the outside of their body. And sometimes they'll even, the predators will even kind of open up their mouth and they'll let the, the cleaner rats pick either food particles or uh, parasites around their mouths. Um, so in that case, the predators suppress their predatory instincts, if you want to call it that, and let this fish groom them, in effect. So that's a mutualism. Both, have, both species benefit by it, and it's clear how it's evolved. We all do a lot in the name of looking better. That's right. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's so adorable. There's like yeah. a little assembly line, everybody getting cleaned. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Countless reviewers have written that if you go too deep into the philosophy of this movie, the feel-good spirit of the story turns back on itself in an ugly way. In the animal kingdom, carnivores are carnivores, and herbivores are herbivores, and they each act in certain ways. Scientifically speaking, 
what liberates us from you know such a rigid biological path? Well, this is, I mean, it's pretty evident in the movie that one of the reasons why these animals in the movie are so attractive, enticing, is because they take on a lot of human, human traits. But, you know, in what sets humans apart for most of the animal kingdom is that we have a, our consciousness and our ability for rational thought and understanding of what uh, our behaviors are, or what our instincts might want us to do, and our ability to change them or to do something other than we might instinctively want to do or find ourselves doing. And absolutely no other species of animals has that, that well, this is, or ability to override instinct? It depends. The, the, that's traditionally been the understanding, but increasingly these days, people are, scientists are starting to find evidence. I don't think it's wide, necessarily widely accepted yet, but it's, it could be that there are some other, particularly mammals, although in some cases some birds, are, you know, have seemingly some kind of, it's hard to say, conscious consciousness, but they do act in, in ways that are human-like, in, in, if you will, in like, certain ways. Well, some whales, animals that form, mammals that form social groups, and so show concern and mm -hmm. for, for others and seemingly grieve when they lose elephants, some whales, things like this. What do you think of the anthropomorphization of animals that we constantly use to tell children stories? Well, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I, in this particular case, I think that this movie is both, I can see why small children would really enjoy it. Uh, it's also written at a, at a much higher level, so a lot, there's a lot of jokes that only the adults surely can get. The children are not old, not old enough to understand some of these things. I don't mind the anthropomorphism. Um, as long, I guess, at the same time, somewhere in the education of those children at some time in their lifetime, they come to understand the, true, the truth about these different animals, too. So. I, I see it in my own children that a, a lot of what, um, what we grow, growing up to think that bugs are icky or sharks are super scary happens culturally. Right, yeah, like well, my, my two-year-old daughter has a shark towel, yeah. and it was given to my son. But the, she was supposed to get the cute bunny and the pink right. unicorn, and she never wants to wear right. them. Well, there are, right, there are stereotypes. Yeah. So if people think of sharks as these nasty, terrible creatures. Well, yes, if you're a small fish and they happen to want to eat you, they're pretty terrible. But sharks are, are marvelous creatures in their own right, and they have a place in nature, and we would suffer, will suffer, and are suffering terribly environmentally by losing them and so people need to understand that that side of things and uh, I'm a, uh, a herpetologist by formal training. And when you tell people that you're a herpetologist right. what do you think most people think that you uh, uh, do or study? Well uh, many of them say I study herpets that's that's what you should study if you're a herpetologist. And nobody thinks it's STDs? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, well, okay, yeah, not, 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 the, not the group I hang out with, maybe the group that you hang out with. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even <laughs> think about that. Um, uh, but So you study snakes. I study amphibians and That's reptiles. That's your jam. Right, okay. right, right, I'm into that. Um, and, and so, you know, people think, well, reptiles, ooh, they're slimy and slithery and they're untrustworthy and so forth. And first of all, that's, I mean, some of that is just absolutely false. They're not they're not slimy. They're and they are very they're, trustworthy. They're All the actual, snakes I hang out with are very discreet. <laughs> they've never. They've always paid me back. They're. They're. Um, I don't have any complaints. Their. Their skin is all is very dry. They're not slimy. They are. Again, they have their own set of marvelous adaptations. They're. Uh, I've had them as pets. They're quite. Uh, they're quite easy to take care of, and they're not necessarily dangerous. And uh, it's just a, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Well, my, my friend Mark Siddall, he's a curator yeah. at the American Museum of Natural History, and he's been on the show. He's a leech guy. Yeah. He says that, that this Disney film should be called Mammaltopia. Yeah, he's because, absolutely right. Yeah, we're so fixated on what we deem cute. The, what we, what we uh, uh, sarcastically in the profession call the charismatic megafauna, because there's, um, yes, people are just charmed by furry animals and large furry animals and this is the they get they capture all of the attention of the public and the media meanwhile there's all these other spectacular animals out there that don't get ni anything close to their due and yet they should so yes it's and the movie is almost all mammals it should be called mammalotopia so yeah believe me there's no leeches that that make their <laughs> make their appearance in this movie so in in the film um the yeah. animals are poisoned by this flower called yep. the night howler yep 
and it makes them all change their behaviors. Yep. Is, there, is, is that flower exist? It, is makes, it, it changes their behavior in a particular way in the context of the movie, which makes them go, they say, go savage, meaning here you have all these different species of animals which are getting along and by and large just fine in a civilized community and so forth, and yet they eat this, the, the juice from the flower and suddenly they go savage. They revert back to their predator, the predators revert back to their predatory mist. Um, there, there's no, there's no, nothing called the night howlers and so called that in nature. There are, interestingly, a lot of species of plants that do have, that do produce chemicals naturally that do affect behavior of animals. I mean, we're very familiar with some of them. One is called alcohol, of course. Another one is called marijuana. I mean, there's all kinds of plants and hallucinogenic plants on humans. But the one that I, I'm particularly interested in the context of this movie is called the loco weed. I don't know if you've ever heard about no. it. It's a common name of a, of a series of... Loco? Like crazy? Loco, yeah, loco weed, which is a common name for species of plants in Western North America. They're also found, many species are found in other parts of the world. And it's called loco weed in part because people don't eat it, but um, livestock often will eat it, uh, cattle and horses, just on the rangeland. And if they, it's, it, if they eat too much of it for too long a period, I mean, they will ultimately die or get be debilitated by it. And it, and it makes them very sluggish and, and st they, 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 they just don't get, do very well. And in ca some cases, they can become aggressive. It doesn't show the same signs that the, the uh, night howlers do in the, in the movie, but um, it's an interesting case. And, and also, I was actually I was so sufficiently curious about this after the movie. The, I looked this up. The, some of the flowers of loco weed look very much like the flowers of the night howlers ah. in the movie. And I wonder if the producers of the movie or the writers use that as an inspiration. Um, so, there are, yes, there's plenty of precedent for, for plant products to change behavior of animals. It's nothing like this. You, it's not like something where you give it to a dog and suddenly it becomes a wolf within a few minutes. Nothing like that happens. Given that herpetology is is concerned with animals that creep, yep. I would like to talk about the creepiest of all creatures, reptiles, or at least most of us find them yep. creepy. You, yep. you clearly find them cuddly. Right, right. In all of American movie and TV history, we here at Science Goes to the Movies could only come up with three non-dinosaur good guys. Johnny Depp's 2011 animated chameleon Rango, Hanna-Barbera's 1960s Wally Gator, the swinging alligator in the swamp, and of course the Teenage Ninja Turtles. Is, is there anything that's remotely scientifically accurate about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Practically not. Okay. I mean, they do have, they're depicted as having a shell, a, 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 a carapace, so what we technically term is the carapace, the upper shell. On oh, the can, top. I, can I just show off the one thing, I, one cool thing I know about turtles? Please do. Um, the the little squares on their backs. Yes. Called scoots, right? Yes, scoots. I just I just love knowing that. Well, that's very good. My four year old good, would tell good, you that good, one too. Good Thank for you. you. Thank very you. good. So yes, the carapace is made of scutes, dorsal scutes, and they also have a the turtles have a plastron, another shell on the underside, and if you look at how the it's being depicted there, but with pecs, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And but in, oh, those are actually scutes as well. Okay. In, in the real thing. But you'll also notice that Ninja Turtles are depicted with teeth. Oh, yeah. Turtles are toothless. The, right. the earliest fossil turtle had teeth, but they, the, all modern turtles lack teeth. So there's virtually nothing. And even one, they have teeth, of course, because if I'm not mistaken, one of the mutant Ninja Turtles eats pizza. That is true. Y impossible to eat pizza without... But I mean, in your teeth. opinion, are turtles badasses? No. Really? No. And, you, and you study these? Okay. They're I adorable. thought you were going to champion are, them. No, no, no. They're, oh, they're adorable. They're adorable. Okay. They're absolutely adorable. How about this, though? The, a turtle, some turtles can live like 100 years, yes, right? Yes, very long. So a turtle's adolescence could last about 30 years? Yes. So a lot of turtles are teenagers. Okay. I guess let's put it that okay. way. Another way to think of it. Yep. Uh, that, that's absolutely true. Are movies unfairly portraying reptiles? I mean, are, are they misunderstood in our culture? Well, I mean, you know, think about snakes on a plane and uh, Anaconda, all of these movies and so forth, these are not favorable depictions of, <laughs> of snakes. I mean, they're, they're, they may be ac yeah, I mean, accurate in terms of depicting them as big predators, predatory animals and so forth. But again, you know, snakes are, uh, a lot of snakes aren't 
nasty. They're not, they don't pose any danger to humans. They serve a very important role in nature. They're marvelous creatures that have evolved all these very sophisticated uh, adaptations for detecting prey items and sensing temperature and, and so forth. They have, uh, if not maternal behavior, they have all kinds of really highly evolved reproductive specializations. And so for some of them are viviparous. They give birth to live young and so forth. So they're really quite cool. And what I find knowing about the natural history of these things is I find these things and when I, as, as cool and as exciting as you know, them eating. And when I introduce these topics or these facts to students, they do too. So I think the, the general public actually has the capacity to appreciate snakes and reptiles on another level if only the media would give them a chance and wouldn't just fixate on certain things. I know you're not an evolutionary biologist, but, but why do you think it is? Oh, I am. An oh, you are? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Oh, forgive me. Yeah. Let me, oh, I know you're an evolutionary <laughs> biologist, so you can answer this yes. question. Well, we'll see but if I can. What, what do you think it is about us that makes so many people so fearful of, say, snakes, and we're ready to watch, you know, an entire Disney musical about an about a adorable lion? When, when, you know, in our past, we had to... We probably had to run just as fast from lions as we did from snakes, right? They they could all harm us. Why are we so prone to feel yeah, I, fuzzy I, about mammals? I, I I don't. Again, there are some some people who have tried to see if there might be some. In, you know, and certain animals have instinctive behavioral responses to shapes of a certain size, or certain animals, small mammals will, if you, if you bring a silhouette of a, that looks like a hawk over them, they will immediately retreat. They can just, they, they sense a predator. So some people have actually suggested that maybe there's something in our human behavior that instinctively responds this way to snakes. But it's hard to really prove that when it could equally, if not more, for more compelling reasons be, this is just the societal context in which we live. For many of us, we never encounter snakes in nature, certainly in urban life. You never encounter them in your daily life. And but just, we don't encounter a lion either. And you know, when you buy it, well, there are stuffed maybe it's little lions for But then think stuff. about how are, how are you exposed to it in, a zoo, in, in safely, the media right? and, and so forth. You, 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 you're conditioned to respond to these things in a certain way. Yeah. You know, my, my, I take my kids to a zoo class, mm. and um, they bring out a Madagascar hissing cockroach. Mm. And, you know, this is New York City. Cockroaches are huge and disgusting. If you ask, if you ask me, do you think they're disgusting? In certain kind, in the kitchen. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, I thought I have to be the role model for my kid. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Madagascar hissing cockroach, a little cuter than mm -hmm. your Manhattan mm -hmm. cockroach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, like, I pet, I pet mm -hmm. the cockroach. Mm -hmm. And so she was happy to pet it. And mm -hmm. she loves telling people that she loves Madagascar hissing. Well, when I take my class, I, I take a class to Costa Rica for spring break herpetology class. And we collect snakes and things in the field or pick them up, we let them go again. And I, one of the things I always do when we get a snake is to I'll hold it and I'll have, because some of the students, these are Harvard undergraduates, they've never, never touched seen a lies, they've never touched them. They're very fearful. And I say, no, please, it's safe. I've got the head, just, just touch it. And it, they're shocked. And then, then that sometimes I'll let them hold it in there. They're, it just, they're, they, they're just incredibly surprised. It's just nothing like they had been conditioned to expect. And they come to realize, wow, it's, it's okay. It's not, it's not such a big deal. I'm curious, what's the gender makeup of your herpetology students? Mostly female. Really? Yeah. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. <laughs> we, we have no idea. Just that turns out that that's the, the, the sex bias in the class. Or maybe you're just a really hot professor. Unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> frogs? Okay, frogs versus snakes. Frogs get a much better reception yeah, yeah. in the movies. I, I work mostly on frogs and salamanders, so I, I can agree with that. Okay. In real life, you can tell us, some frogs are really dangerous, right? Actually, many, many species of frogs have some kind of poisonous secretions on their skin, and the ones that typically have the strongest poison or toxin are the most brightly colored ones. They're Which is very considerate. Colored. They're brightly colored. It's called warning, regarded as warning coloration for obvious reasons. Um, for humans, um, if you were to touch and you had an open cut or if you were to ingest it, I don't know why you'd want to do this, it would make you sick. There's only a very small number that actually would, in fact, I only know of one, there may be others, but I'm only certain of one species of frog that really could kill a human just from a small uh, bit of, of its toxin. 
Is that the frog? Is is that the frog? I think I've seen it. Is bright yellow? Or yes, something? it's called Phyllobates terribilis. Okay, like for, terrible. For obvious, yes, for okay. terrible. And it it's found in the Choco region of of Colombia. Is that where? It, is that where? Um, poison. Darts, yes, these right? are these are. Uh, it's used to tip these poison darts. And would just that dart kill you? It could. It could, in fact, in this, the article, was, it, it was, it, there was a very a wonderful study done by uh, some herpetologists here at the American New York at the American Museum of Natural History several years ago. And this was a very unusual scientific paper that talked about the biology of this species. And it also had a section on, the, the author got so in, into the working with the, the native peoples in Colombia that they wrote an article, a part of their article about how to fabricate poison darts. And, and also there was a warning. Not many scientific papers come with a warning about how you're not supposed to handle these things. And they talked, but they discovered inadvertently how, how poisonous this was as they were disposing when they were doing their field work. They were disposing of paper towels that had been, you know, used to, the frogs were living in these, these um, uh, you know, small boxes yeah. and stuff temporarily. And they just put the, the poison, I mean, the paper towels on a trash heap and some of the local dogs ate them and the local <gasps> dogs died. Oh my gosh. Just from, just from consuming the trash. Yeah. So it really is quite, quite nasty. I've read that frogs are in some trouble these days. Yeah. Well, What's frogs and, and amphibians in general, they've been since about 1985. We, the scientific community, have known on a global scale frogs species are, dis populations are declining, some cases precipitously. Why? Many species have gone extinct. Uh, why? Uh, just about everything. Um, habitat loss, they're extremely sensitive to pollution. There's a, a kind of a fungal disease that has been spreading worldwide that is decimating populations in rapid order. Um, uh, global, I mean, climate change, making a lot of forests more less less humid, less, less rainfall and so forth, changing. Climate change, you know, moving uh, for Monte. I have a species named after myself, actually, in Sri Lanka. What's it called? Uh, what it's called Pseudophilautus hankeni. And that's the good news. The bad news is that Pseudophilautus hankeni is found now at the top of a mountain. It's the only place it's found is the top of a small mountain in Sri Lanka. That's its natural range. And the bad news is that with climate change, the forest, as things warm up, the forest is in effect retreating higher and higher up the mountain, and with it, the frogs. And within another 20 or 30 years, the forest, the, the, the climate will no longer be able to sustain that forest and the forest will disappear and with it, Pseudophilatus Hank and I. You can't go extinct. I mean, what do you do about this? It's tough. It's, uh, First of all, what is pseudo? pseudo to us philatus. means fake. Yeah, it's pseudo a fake philatus. It's just, What's it a was, philatus? Philatus is another genus of frogs, meaning it was, it was, <laughs> it's, it's very complicated. This is taxonomy. It's, it's very It's important. It's named after it's, you. It's very, com well, but that's the first part of the name. That's not, that's not me. It has to do with taxonomy and how scientists took a genus called Philautus, and then they realized there were some other frogs that were lumped in there, but not were, oh. in fact, closely related. So they pulled them out of that group. Bakers. And they put them, they put them over here in pseudo Philautus. Okay. It's kind of a lack of originality there. And in the core, so it was, Hank and I is, is with those other pseudo So your last name is Hanken. Yep. Why was it named after you? Did you discover it? I, I didn't discover it, but my, uh, the scientist in Sri Lanka did a postdoctoral fellowship with me, so he was oh. honored uh, the species in my name. That's a huge honor, yeah, right? Yeah, it was quite nice, yeah. I mean, I would imagine that's why you go into the zoology <laughs> business. That's right. right. Yes, and you can't when you discover, I, I name a lot of species of salamanders, and it's not um, proper to name them, your, you can't name them about yourself. Really? So if you discover- This so, is why Donald Trump is not a zoologist. I right, finally no, 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 figured no, no, no. it self, out. No self-aggrandizement is, is possible or allowed. So can you name it after your kids? Yeah, you can name okay. it about, about a lot of different things. I think faith is up for grabs well, the next time you discover you, something. You I would your, be happy. You play your cards right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> what is your favorite movie of all time having to do with animals in any way? Oof. Can't think. I can tell you what my favorite commercial. Please. Because um, there are some animal commercials that, I, unfortunately, they're not. They're not around. You know, these days, we see the Geico gecko. Yeah. Which is okay. Do you I, feel I, like I, he's he's done his part in in making you know herpetology sexy? Uh, not as much as the Budweiser chameleons. <laughs> True. Lou, Louie and Frankie. <laughs> From I think this was from the Super Bowl of 2008 or 2009. For herpetologists, this was, this is the. <laughs> you guys were high fiving each was, other. This was. It just doesn't get any better than that. 
And, and we were, we've been so disappointed that they, they haven't sustained. Come on, there's got to be a sizable number of you guys. You have, we have to like... We have no clout. We have no clout. <laughs> and, and there's also the Budweiser frog. Budweiser. 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 Okay, now, now I know why you got into this game. It's beer. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it plays a big part. You should come to our, you should come to our conferences. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. James, thank yeah. you so much sure. for coming by. My pleasure. Whatever we can't fit into this half hour, we'll share on our Science Goes to the Movies Facebook page. And if you want to watch past episodes, check us out at www.cuny.tv under the Science tab. Or download our app to keep up with all the Science Goes to the Movies in one place. Thank you.